Good morning. If you have your Bibles, if you would, open them to the, uh, the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. And if you need to know where that's at, it's right before chapter 5. And as we're doing so, I, I want to share a story that, uh, that I read this week that, you know, it's so true in a lot of ways when we look at Christians around the world and around the nation and around Las Vegas and the attitudes. But before I say that, I just want to say Jesus lives. You know, just praising Him just now, just, it should be a joy to our heart. And to see that this church is continuing forward. We're going through some hard times, but God is good. Because last week, we even had people coming down that wanted to be baptized, and others that came down and wanted to join the church. And like you heard just a moment ago, sometimes churches don't see that in a time like this that we're going through. So praise God, He is still working. He is still diligent. And church, we are going to go forward praising the Lord in all things. Because it's His way, not ours, but His way. And when I, this story that I want to relate to you and just kind of share with you is about a, a man that was at the, it was in the middle of the Golden Corral restaurant. You ever hear of those? Some of you have ate there. They've got pretty decent food, right? And as he was there, he was standing there with Thousand Island dressing dripping from his hair over his glasses. Now picture this. All down the side of his face, all over his jacket, his pants, all down his shoes. And I'm not talking just a little bit like you would see in a little spoon that you dip out or those little packages. No, no, no. This was two gallons, two gallons of Thousand Island dressing poured all over him. See, what had happened was a waitress was carrying a two gallon drum or container of this dressing this salad dressing, and as she paused just for a couple moments, remember those swinging doors at the Golden Gate? Guess what? Those doors hit her, and as they hit her, she went forward. She was knocked forward, and in that, she spilt two gallons on this guy. And don't you know, he just went ballistic. Started screaming and shouting, cursing at her. He was even saying sta statements like, you're so stupid. You are so stupid. I can't believe that you would do something like this. This is a brand new suit. It cost me $300. This, you're, you're so stupid. It, I can't believe this suit is ruined. $300 suit. And his wife, as she piped in, and she started screaming, yes, you've ruined my husband's $300 suit. And it's the first time he's had the opportunity to wear it. So the man screams and he says, I want to see the manager and I want to see the manager right now. Well, the employee was thoroughly shaken. So she went and got the manager and the manager came out. Now picture this. Here's a guy with two gallons of Thousand Island dressing all over him, dripping. And as the manager, young manager comes around the corner, he walks up and says, is there a problem? The guy screams, is there a problem? You bet there's a problem. This is a brand new suit. It cost me $300. I want a new suit. And the manager says, well, sir, we'll be glad to get the suit clean for you. You, know, you, you got to realize accidents do happen. And we're really sorry about this. But the man says, no, no, no. I want a brand new suit. I don't want it clean. I want a brand new one. I want a check for $300 and I want it right now. So the manager decided, instead of creating more drama in the restaurant, went back to the back room, grabbed the check, and wrote a check for $300, and brought it and gave it to the man. Justice served. Tragically, this true story happened at noon on a Sunday. Now why, let me ask you this, would someone be wearing a brand new suit on Sunday. 
Do you suppose that this man and his wife had just went to church? Do you suppose that they had just heard maybe a sermon on love your neighbor as yourself? Do you think they might have heard a sermon on do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Or go the second mile? See, Christians, we are to be the light of the world. We are to be shining for Jesus Christ. And no matter if we're in these doors or out there in the world, people watch us. And we need to be praising Jesus at all times. We need to be thinking about Him at all times. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. And I realize we just had a very good conversation in our Sunday school class about loving our neighbor and how difficult that can be sometimes. But folks, we have to do that because we are Christians, amen? amen? That's what Jesus would say. That's what Jesus would do. And Jesus wants us as Christians to continue to be the light of the world and to continue in all aspects, whether it be out there or in here in this church. And in the church, Jesus wants what? He wants unity between his brothers and sisters. Huh? He wants us to stand together, to pray together, to stay together in unity. And that's where we're at today in the scriptures that we're going to be reading. If you have your Bibles open, would you please stand as we read Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 1 there. Ephesians chapter 4 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, and with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we do thank you for your word. And God, we, we just ask that today, that as we read it, and Lord, as we go through it, that you would open our hearts, open our ears, Lord, to help us to apply it in our daily lives. God, we love you, and we praise you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Now, maybe you missed it, or maybe you didn't, or maybe you might have noticed it, but I want to recall, there was one time when the San Francisco Giants, anybody know who they are? San Francisco Giants, now this is baseball, they, their starting lineup as they were announced, start running out on the field, and this was during the World Series, and as they were running out, a player would jog over to the first base, and he would stand there, and he'd wait, Brother Steve, till the other players would come out. And as the next player would come out, what would they do? Be like a high five or a handshake, pat on the back, something, right? Well, as they did this, one of their star players, when he was announced, I'm not going to mention his name this morning because he's probably heard this too many times, he jogged out and just went to his spot in line, avoiding all the other players. And when you think about it, a team like that in baseball. It takes all 25 players on the team to either win the game or lose the game, right? He might have been the best hitter and the best player on the team, but he still missed something, huh? He was not the only player on that team. On the other hand, it was a while later during a Super Bowl game. It was New England Patriots and they didn't announce their star players before the game. But instead, they, they didn't want them to run out and have the spotlight. So what they did was they just announced the whole team. Here they are, the New England Patriots. And what happened? The whole team ran together right out there on that field together. They were unified. They were together. Win or lose, they were doing it as one. And as we can remember, you know, they really just didn't even have a prayer to win in that game. But they did. 
They won that Super Bowl game. And many of us don't even remember who they played, but we won't remember that they won. They won that game because they were unified and they were together. In today's scripture, Paul brings something very special out on the fact of the church and how it's supposed to be one. We are supposed to be unified together. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with everyone on every issue all the time. It doesn't mean that we will have the same gifts and the abilities and the skills. Because why? In many respects, we're called to be unified and to celebrate our diversity because we're all part. The Bible tells us that we're, we are all members of one body. Well, I'll tell you what. My wife this, this past week busted her knee. She had to have major surgery on the kneecap. She's learned that that knee is a major vital part of her body, getting up and down. And I think, you know, so many times when, when we think about the church members and everything else, I've presented this to new membership classes, and we are all part of the body of Christ in the church. Every one of us is so, so important. But from the, the people that are just doing the, 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 the things behind the scenes that we never see. You know, it could be, we had one gentleman I'll never forget. And you guys might have remembered him. He used to come in on like Monday mornings with a five-gallon bucket, get out of his car, walk around, start pulling weeds, get back in his car and drive away. That was an important ministry to him. And it was important to God because it was God's house and he was doing something. And so every one of us have different skills and talents and, and, and things. You know, I'll never forget the first day I walked into Spring Valley Baptist Church. There was a man that met me at the front door. He's very quiet. Maybe some of you know him. I think he came from Hawaii. <laughs> Extremely quiet guy. But I'll never forget Brother Steve meeting me at that front door and greeting me that very first time coming in these doors. And I've talked to so many of you that re recall that first time. That was a gift that Steve's got, huh? Hospitality right there, meeting us, greeting us. That's one of his abilities and skills. And so we're not all like that. Some of us are, we're loud compared to Steve, huh? But in the book of Ephesians here, more, more than any of Paul's other letters, as a matter of fact, it was 18 times, Paul says the church is supposed to be a unity and that we share the same faith. Guys, we got to realize that. We share the same faith. No matter what we're doing, we share that same faith. And if you read through the, the entire book of Ephesians, sometimes you, you'll start thinking, Paul's just kind of repeating himself. Well, and some of it he is. He is repeating himself because he believes, and so does Jesus Christ, that unity is not just a good thing, but it is a must in the church to stay united. And what Paul is telling is, it is crucial for the church. See, if Spring Valley Baptist Church wants to be the church that Jesus Christ has called it to be, then we will adhere to Paul's words and we will continue on. We have had a pastor here for tw over 25 years that has led this flock in a mighty, mighty way. And I know Johnny would be right here right now telling us, stay united and continue strong for Christ. Amen? That's what he would want is for us to stay united and continue spreading the gospel to the world. What is our calling? It is more than anything else that we believe that we have been redeemed by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. To believe and confess in our hearts, with our, with our mouths, our tongues, saying that, you know what? God has been raised. He has raised Jesus from the dead. And I believe that. And I believe Jesus, He was crucified on that cross, buried and rose again, and that He is coming back for me. That he has saved me by shedding his blood and paying the price right there. Because see, when we believe that, we confess that, what happens to us? We become a new creation. The Bible says all things have passed away. All things become new. Our old nature dies. Our new nature becomes alive. And that person with that new nature is what? A Christian. And as a Christian, we're called by God 
to live holy lives, to live united lives, to live for Christ. We are called by God. And when we answer that call, it's a worthy answer. It's a worthy reason that we're doing so. In, in a, see, in other words, our conduct should be such that it brings honor to Christ in all things. Not like the guy at the, the Golden Corral and, and sitting there and, and eating and yelling and screaming over his suit. But in all areas, in all aspects of our lives, Paul gives us very concrete examples of what it means to live a worthy life. See, beginning in verse 2 in, here in Ephesians, where we just read, Paul tells us not to just be humble, but to be completely humble. Now that's hard, huh? And the Greeks, they only use this word in a negative sense. But when you read this here, Paul, he wants us to use humble or humility in a positive manner. Not a negative manner, a positive manner. To be humble, it focuses on our thinking. It literally means lowliness of mind. In other words, you don't just think about yourself. You're thinking about your brothers and your sisters. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, though. It's, it's rather seeing our lives as a gift from God. Because it, our life is a gift from God. Amen? Any ability that we have has been given to us by who? God the Creator. And then, you know, through our life experiences, yeah, we develop and we mature, we, we grow, and others start to praise you in different areas and everything, but don't talk yourselves up. Continue the fight. You know, some of you might remember Walter Cronkite. Remember him? He was a famous newscaster, for those of you who don't re recall the name. And he was sailing one day, him and his wife, down the it was a mystic river in Connecticut. And going through shallow water. And then all of a sudden this boat came by that was filled with young, young adults. And as it passed by them, they started waving and shouting. Walter's wife looked over at him and she goes, Honey, do you know what they were shouting? And Walter says, Yes. They were saying, Hello, Walter. And she goes, no, 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 honey, no. They were shouting, low water, low water. <laughs> See, such are the problems when we are not too humble. He got himself into some problems there, huh? See, Paul, then he urges us to be gentle. And gentleness could be translated as meekness. And most people think that, you know, being meek, those types of people are what? They're kind of wishy-washy and they. But that's not true. That's not what God's Word is saying. The ideal, he'll, ideal here is being, make the word gentleness. Gentleness. What is that? Strength under control. See, in the Greek, the word was used of wild horses that were trained. They were wild, but they had been trained. Meekness is a condition of the mind and the heart which demonstrates gentleness. Not because you're weak, but it comes out of your strength. It's a balance born in strength of character. There was a quote that said, Meekness is the quality of a strong personality who is nevertheless master of himself and the servant of others. It is the absence of the disposition to assert personal rights, either in the presence of God or of men. Next year, Paul is telling us that people, we need to be patient. And as we sung a while ago, we will wait on the Lord. We will wait on the Lord. Sometimes God's timing is not our timing, huh? And we don't understand, but we have to wait on the Lord because His timing is perfect. And what he's going to do is going to be perfect. He says, you know what? Be, per just be patient. Long-suffering toward people. And sometimes that's hard because sometimes people are aggravating, huh? And you have to be patient just as God is with us. And then Paul tells us 
to bear with one another. It literally means to suffer with one another. Paul is calling for you and I to put up with each other. And isn't that true of life? That we have to put up with each other? We have to put up with some people all the time, huh? Sometimes at work, sometimes at home, sometimes even you know, at school and around the church. But when we bear with one another, it's like saying, I see the struggles in your life, but I have made a decision not to concentrate on that, but instead, I choose to see what the Lord is doing in your life. That's working and bearing one another's burdens. huh? That will change how we look at others. That sometimes could be a scary task for some of us. But God says, we're to look at the other person and say, you know, what is God going to do in that person's life? I've got to bear with them, stick with them. And finally, Paul concludes by telling us, whatever we do, we must do it with, one, with a spirit of love. With love. That's the cornerstone right there. He tells us in Colossians 3.14, over all virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. And that's in Colossians 3.14. Love is the bedrock. It is the foundation. Without love for one another, we never will have true unity. The love Paul is talking about here is called agape love. It is a community-based love, which is also a costly love. That is the same type of love that Jesus Christ has for you and I when He put His arms out on that cross. He loved us so much, He gave His own life for us. It is a love that is willing to risk it all because you love the other person. It is the love that moves a person to lay down their life for one another. With that in mind now, Paul, he takes us to the next level in these verses. And that level is is a call for unity within the church. In verse 3, notice, he tells us to make every effort to be diligent, be committed to keep unity of the Holy Spirit. If we give up on this, then we give up on the church. And we're not going to do that here at Spring Valley, are we? We're going to stay diligent and continue doing God's work. Because without unity in the church, we never reach the greatness that Jesus Christ has destined for us. That's, because, that's how important it is in our lives and for this church. See, in his commentary on Ephesians, there was a guy named Mark Barth, Marcus Barth, excuse me, and he said this about verse 3 here, and specifically when it talked about make every effort. Listen to his words. It is hardly possible to render exactly the urgency contained in the underlying Greek verb. Not only haste and passion, but a full effort of the whole man is meant, involving his will, his sentiment, his reason, physical strength, and total attitude. The imperative mood of the practical found in the Greek text excludes being passive, having quietism, or a wait-and-see attitude. Yours is the initiative. Do it now. Mean it. You are to do it. And that was the overtones of Paul's words right there in verse 3 when he said, make every effort. Do it now. Make the effort in our lives. So what is unity? Unity is not being, you know, having uniformity. It's not being the same or thinking the same. It concerns gathering around the same things and being bound together because of them. Just like people go to a baseball game because they have the same basic interest in watching the game. In the same manner, oh, Paul here, he lists seven things that must unify every person who is a Christian. And we absolutely cannot waver on any of these seven things. We'll quickly kind of highlight them and go through them because they're so, so very important. I want you to realize here, first, we are one body. We are one body. We aren't an organization. Our bodies are comprised of a thousand different cells put together, but there is one life. A body is not produced by combining sections of autonomy together. A body is produced because of one original cell that's growing and it continues to grow until it becomes an amazing, amazing creation. You and I. Every cell shares that original life. That is the secret of a body. 
All the parts of it share or, or shared life together. In the same way, we are members of the body of the church. We are Christians. Remember, the church is not just a building. Instead, the church is made up into the body of believers. Those of you here today and at the next services and all the people that come through these doors. All the people that come through these doors that place their faith in Jesus Christ. And they love Christ. That is a body. There is one Spirit. That same Spirit dwells within each believer. So, by saying that and thinking of that, we have interconnectedness. We are connected together because of Christ. And if the Spirit, it is the Spirit which produces unity in our, our lives together here at the church. is the body of Christ. We are also, what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. So in the same way, the Holy Spirit which led us to become believers in Jesus Christ, it's the Spirit of God and it keeps us alive today and in unity. Folks, there's also, the next thing is there is one hope of our calling. We have a hope in Christ because He destroyed death. Amen? As you recall, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 15.55, where he says, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? You see, we are victors there, huh? Death no longer has a hold on us because of what? What Jesus did on that cross. Paying that price for each and every one of us here today. He has paid that price and He has said He will go and prepare a place for each and every one of us. A mansion. A great mansion. I hope it's got your name there too. That is why Paul tells us not to grieve like so many that do grieve at funerals. See, because when we have the hope knowing that our loved one knew Christ, we know that this is not the end. We know that all Christians one day will all be worshiping Christ together right there in heaven. Praise the Lord for that. And we also have to realize there is one Lord. We serve only one Lord. Jesus Christ. There are no other options in this. If we think that we can serve other gods, then we're not Christians. If we serve the same Lord, then we all should be able to walk and continue walking together in unity. Amen? There is one faith, and that one faith rests squarely right on Jesus Christ. This is the truth which Christ has given to the church, revealed in God's Word, His Holy Word. Once again, there is no other options here. Either your faith is in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, or it's not. See, there's no kind of, sort of, well, maybe I kind of know Jesus. Maybe I kind of know I'm going to heaven. Maybe I kind of, no, no, no. Either you know you're going to heaven and you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior or you don't. And that is something that we as a church body need to proclaim. As Christians, we need to proclaim and let people know there's, there's one road to heaven. The Bible is clear when it tells us that. One road. Jesus. Jesus. You know, God's Word tells us Christ said, if you're not for me, then you're against me. We share one faith. We are all equal also at the foot of the cross. Nobody is better than our neighbor. Christ died equally for you and for me and for everybody out there in Las Vegas and around the world. Now, there's a story that's probably not real, but you know, it's kind of like a parable that I wanted to share with you. And it was about a lady that she had went to the doctor and found out she had a terminal disease and was dying. And she went to her pastor and told him and, and they decided to sit down and discuss what exactly what the memorial service would be like. And as she went through all the details at the end, he looked at her and said, is there anything else? And she said, yes, there's one more thing. One more thing. It's the most important last request that I have. When I pass, make sure that I have a full burial and make sure people see me at a viewing. And make sure that I have a fork in my hand. 
And he looked at her kind of funny and said, a fork? You, know, you realize that people are going to ask about the fork. And she goes, that's the point. I want people to ask. And he goes, well, I'm going to ask right now. What is, what is the fork? And she said, you know what? When I was growing up, going to church, we used to have potlucks, and we used to have dinners at the church and celebrations and everything else. And when people came together, we had some excellent meals, great food. But my grandmother used to always tell me, hold on to your fork. Because the best is yet to come. Talking about the desserts and everything else. The best is yet to come. So she said, you know what? I want people to realize that. I want people to see that. Because I'm not afraid of dying. Because I know the best is yet to come. Because I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And when I pass away, I want people to look at that fork. And I want them to see that. And I want them to ask. And I want you to stand there and tell them the best is yet to come. Not only do I look forward to seeing Jesus face to face, but I want everyone else to see Jesus face to face. And when I read that and thought about this parable this week and this story, I thought, wow, that's how we ought to be in our lives too, huh? Wanting everyone to see Jesus face to face. How are we going to do that? By staying united and staying together. But Paul also tells us there is one baptism He's referring to the ordinance of baptism there. And, and this is where a, a believer is baptized in the body of Christ at conversion. It's a signal to the world that we belong to one family. It's a symbol of being dead to our old self and becoming fully alive in Jesus Christ. In the f- church family where Christ, Jesus, is the head of the church. He is the head, not us. Jesus is the head of the church. And finally, we see there is one God, one Father, This may be another way of simply saying that we are all in one family. It is the family of God. Those who have been born again can now refer to God as their Father in heaven. Their heavenly Father. How special is that? You know, the Scriptures even say, Abba, Father. Can you imagine seeing Christ? In the family of God, there is a community. Our heavenly Father is perfect in His wisdom and His love. And He is over all of us in authority over us. And through us, ministering through each and every one of us. And He's residing in all of us. He is the One who brings us together. So what does all this mean that we've been talking about mean for Spring Valley Baptist Church? Folks, it means everything. If we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, if we believe in God's love for us and His desire that we be a community and a family, then comes the big question. Is our faith enough to persuade us to live a life worthy of our calling as children of Jesus Christ? In other words, are you so deeply holding on to anger and bitterness in your own life that Christ is really not able to rule your spirit and your soul because everything else that's going on? Will you let it go and give it to Christ? Ask Jesus to help you through those times. Maybe you've got, there's some out there that have desires to control all their issues in their lives. You know, we can't do it by ourselves, huh? Have you tried to control all the issues in your life in the last two or three weeks? How's that worked? Not well, huh? Well, we've got to give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. And maybe there's some that have petty concerns on our earthly life. Petty concerns. You know, when we look at life and we go, wow, I can't believe this is happening or that's happening around the house or at the church or at work or whatever it is. But when you step back and look at kingdom things, God's things, these things here on earth are so petty. And we have to realize that and say, you know what? I want to worship the one true king. And I want to do that together with my brothers and sisters. You see, we are one body. We are one body, just like my wife Olga and I and our boys are one family. You and I and everybody else that are brothers and sisters in Christ, we make up the family of this church and of God's kingdom, huh? We are the church. It means that you do all you can to build up the body, not tear it down. Why? Because we are a, what? A unit. 
We have unity. We are one. See, because it's not our goal to tear down our children. We would never do something like that, huh? And in the same way, our goal must be to build up one another. You know, 40 times Paul in his letters used the phrase, one another, one another, one another. Every time, it's in a positive manner. Every time. The call of the church is to be unified despite differences. We've experienced a lot of things go on in the church here at Spring Valley in the last few weeks and, and months. We've had some tough times and we've had some joyous times. Some great times. There's been some projects and th- some things that occurred that not everybody liked. But we've carried forward because of why. That's the will of God to continue forward. And as long as we continue to seek God and to bring God the glory and to honor Jesus Christ, Spring Valley Baptist Church will live and flourish in spreading His Word around this valley and around the world. I have so much confidence in this church and I know that if we continue as we've done in all these years to pray, as everyone came up this morning, everybody's talking, we got to pray, guys. We got to pray. We need to be praying about tonight's meeting. We need to be praying about the church as a whole. We need to be praying about our ministries. We need to be praying about Vacation Bible School. We need to be praying for our youth. We need to be praying for each other. And as we do that, we're going to continue to prevail and to share Christ. We're going to continue to grow in numbers. We're going to continue. But most importantly, we're going to be a church that has the boldness at all times to proclaim Jesus in our lives. That Jesus is the one that saves. That Jesus is the way to heaven. No other way. We can never waver on that. We're going to demonstrate God's love by the way we act and how we act out there in the world. How about us? Do we desire to be a church that others, when they look by and see us, they say, man, that church is so together. That's, that church has unity. I want to be a part of that. How are we? You know, but maybe today I'm, I've been talking about all these things and you say, well, Terry, I, I, I don't know Christ. You talk about one way to heaven, one road to heaven, and, and Jesus is the only way, but I really don't know that. So what am I to do? Well, God loves you, and God wants you to know Him personally. And it's really easy just by saying, Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart and soul and save me, Lord, because I cannot do this by myself. But you know, Satan is so good about throwing distractions out there and everything else that he will try to break you down, tear you down and everything and make you think that you're not saved or you're not worthy enough. And I was reading a story this week and it was so cute because it was, it was about a little boy and his little sister and they went to grandma and grandpa's house. And when they got there, they walked in, and it was Saturday morning. They were standing here kind of playing and, and doing stuff, and the little boy went in the backyard by himself. And he looked over in the backyard, and he saw a duck sitting there. So he walked over and started playing with the duck, having a good time, but you know how boys are. Got a little rough and started playing with a stick, and before you knew it, accidentally hit the duck and killed it. As he did so, he didn't know what to do then. Now he panicked. So he picked the little duck up, and he's looking around, and thought, man, Grandma's not here. I might be okay. So he runs over to the side, and he digs a little hole, and he puts the duck in. He's trying to bury it, thinking, nobody saw it. I'll get away with it. And he looks up, and he sees the beak sticking out still, and he's trying to bury it, and he's frantic. And he looks back at the house, and guess what? His little sister is like this in the kitchen window, and he's like, oh, no. So he runs back in the house, and he says, please, you can't tell, you can't tell, you can't tell. And she says, I won't tell, I won't tell. 
You won't? You won't tell Grandma? No, I won't tell. Well, later on that evening, they finish dinner. Grandma says to the little girl, come on, honey, it's time for us to do the dishes. And she goes, I don't think so. She goes, I think my brother wants to help you tonight. <laughs> and looks at him and says, remember the duck? <laughs> He's like, oh. So he goes over and he helps Grandma do the dishes. They get up the next morning. Grandma comes out and says, honey, to the little girl, today your brother and your grandpa are going to do something special. They're going out to the lake. They're going to go fishing. You and I are going to stay around the house, and I want you to help me clean because I have a lot of work to do and some laundry and stuff, and I want you to help me. She says, I don't think so, Grandma. Gra I think he, he said that he wanted me to go fishing because... My brother, he, he wanted to stay home and, and be with you today, and he wanted to work with you. Well, the little boy's sitting there thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. So finally he screams out, I killed the duck. Grandma, forgive me. Forgive me. I killed the duck. I'm so sorry. I killed the duck. He starts crying and begging for mercy. And Grandma looks at him and says, I know. I've already forgiven you. But what you don't know is when your sister was looking through the kitchen window, I was looking through the dining room window. <laughs> and I was just waiting for you to confess it to me. Folks, Christ is just waiting for you, if you don't know him personally, to just say, Jesus, thank you. Forgive me. I cannot do this alone. Would you stand with me this morning? As we come to this time of invitation, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Make today the day that you say, Lord, forgive me. Come down and talk to me or one of our brothers here. And if you're sitting here today and you're saying, God, I need to work on my unity. I need to work on working together with my brothers and sisters. Let's pray about that. It's a time for prayer. If you just want to come down and say, God, let's pray about tonight. Let's pray about what we're doing as we go forward here at this church. Come right down and pray. At a time like this, at an invitation, we should be full up here, Brother Steve. It should be full with prayer lifted up to God because He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As we sing, you come. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. May God bless you and keep you safe this week. Watch over you and shine His face on you. And I hope to see you, as many of you as possible tonight. God bless you. Have a great day.